All right. Uh, hello. Welcome to Adventures Among Ideas. Hopefully everything will work okay this time. Uh, my other camera is not working, so back to using this kind of uh, funky looking camera, but whatever. Uh, there's always something, always some problem. But anyway, today, Adventures Among Ideas, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, John Dewey again, who I like a lot. John Dewey's, um, I'm going to look at his critique of the reflex arc concept, his uh, critique of the reflex arc concept. This was, uh, uh, he first wrote about this in a paper in 1896 called The Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology. This is a classic paper, one of the classic uh, papers in psychology, and it's good to know about. I think everyone, well, at least uh, you know, people who deal in this area, who work in this area, will know the paper. Um, they may or may not have actually read it, though. Um, I've spent um, a lot of time reading it recently. I, I read it before, but um, it didn't really uh, sink in, I think. So I decided to focus on it this week just to, uh, you know, have an excuse to look at it again and um, absorb it more than I have in the past. So it's a, it is a really good paper. It can be tough to read. Dewey can always be a little um, tough to read, I think. But he's trying to bring out the organic quality of things, the, you know, fluid nature of things in his writing and so that just can make it a little difficult i think i think that's why some of some of his writing is difficult um so his paper on the reflex art concept is critiquing the concept of stimulus and response that was common in psychology psychology and is still common in psychology so in the 19th century you would see this in people like um, James Mark Baldwin, um, a famous, I think, American um, psychologist. George Romains, a famous um, Canadian psychologist in the 19th century. In the 20th century, you'll see this in a lot of the behaviorists. And this is one thing that makes behaviorism tricky to interpret. And you see this also in, you know, continuing in other branches of, in other schools of psychology and in neuroscience. Just this idea of stimulus and then response. Stimulus and then response. And it has two forms. Um, Dewey is interested in human behavior, so he focuses on the second form that I'll mention. But the first form is um, just basic stimulus response, like a reflex or... Um, what the behaviorists, behaviorists would call unconditioned, an unconditioned reflex. So it's kind of a hereditary, you know, just action, um, maybe genetically determined action. You get some kind of stimulus and you just respond. So there's not a pro kind of a process of deliberation. Uh, but then there's another uh, form of this, the stimulus idea response form, which um, I think Dewey is more interested in since he's more interested in human behavior and not, um, well, he's more interested in, uh, you know, thoughtful behavior, deliberate behavior, as opposed to just reflexive behavior. And he doesn't, doesn't write that much about animal behavior as far as I can recall. Um, yeah, so this is more the idea of conscious behavior, intentional behavior, deliberate behavior, where there's a stimulus and then there's some kind of something happening, something going on, and then there's the response. Um, but in either case, I think his basic critique of the um, of the uh, uh, reflex art concept is that it's um, dualistic and mechanistic. So it's dualistic, at least. I think it relies. There's a hint there. There's a way in that it, in which it relies on a kind of substance dualism between soul and body. Um, but I think his and he does talk about this a little bit. I think the the main point, though, is it, uh, it's kind of a kind of epistemological dualism. So it isolates the knower and the known. So the knower and the known are taken as two very distinct things, which can only be related in a mechanical type of way. And you might think of this as the bill, classic billiard, billiard ball dynamics, where a ball hits another ball and moves the ball. And 
the stimulus and the response are conceived in that kind of a way. There's a stimulus, it bumps into the um, into the organism, or you know, it uh, creates some pattern in the organism, and this um, a pattern of stimulation, you know, goes into the the central nervous system and uh that creates an action a response a motor response so you've got this stimulus over here and uh it does something and then you get this response over here so we've got sensation on one side movement on the other and it makes uh, in consequence of this the reflex arc makes life into what dewey calls a series of jerks and which i think is a funny phrase for other reasons but you know, he means a, a a quick movement, a short movement, and so it makes uh, that makes experience disjointed. So action becomes a series of jerks. We're getting stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus stimulus response, and uh, it makes life it makes experience disjointed, as he says. So psychological life, psycho, uh, you know, inner experience or the experience of the organism becomes divided into the experience before the stimulation or before the response and experience after the response so you've got kind of the the response as this dividing line between experience and experience so you've got these jerks of, of movement with experience also being divided up in this stimulus response kind of way and he thinks this conflicts with how we actually um, experience the world uh, I also wonder if this, he, Dewey doesn't really talk about this, but I also wonder if this way of thinking can lead to uh, a certain kind of solipsism because we perceive of ourselves, we understand ourselves as separate from the environment, passively in a way, receiving stimuli from this environment over there, which we then act on or not. And we become these external knowers of the of this other environment over there, and we uh, just see ourselves as self-contained in a way, rather than as Dewey would want to see us as phases of this broader environment. So everything's kind of a whole, and you can look at different phases of it, but it's all part of a whole. It's not this and this. It's just all together, and then you can. Um, in analysis kind of mark off these different phases is the Dewey and transactional view of life so in in the in the Dewey and view we're always in relation to the world we're always um, transacting with the world we're always adjusting to the world we're always acting to adjust ourselves adapt ourselves to the world and the world's always changing as a result of our actions our adaptations so there's this mutual thing going on there um, considering whether I should mention, he makes an interesting, um, point in a book called The Knower and the Known, which he wrote with, um, Arthur Bentley. I was wondering if I should mention this. Um, I'll mention it quickly. I wasn't exactly sure how to tie it in, but, um, uh, Dewey and Bentley point out that if an organism only had one transaction with the environment, you know, that's a, it makes it much less clear. It would make it much less obvious to you where the organism begins and the environment ends. And this is kind of a, an intellectual trick to um, get into his point of view. Like if the um, if you only did one action for your whole life, if the organism was only doing one action, you know, that would change how we look at the relation between organism and environment. But the, the fact that we're engaged in many different actions over the course of our lives, um, uh, it tends to uh, allow us to separate ourselves from the environment in um, a new way, just because we're engaged in many different actions. So we tend to think of ourselves as these self-contained actors who can do all these different things. But anyway, so that's uh, uh, just a way to think about it. I don't know if it's helpful helpful or not. It's probably better if you uh, read what he wrote. I'm not explaining it totally in the right way. Um, so, and also I should mention his critique here is related to the distinction he um, would later make between self-action, interaction, and transaction. And again, that comes out more clearly in books like um, The Knower and the Known, the book he did with um, Bentley. <clears throat> 
Uh, so in, uh, just to briefly mention these things. So self-action is this older idea that entities have a certain kind of inner agency or vitality or soul. It kind of goes back to the idea of God as the unmoved, unmoved mover. And we take on a kind of that kind of quality um, to the extent that we're you know, part of that nature, of that divine nature. Um, so that self-action interaction is more of the mechanistic billiard ball type approach. So there's distinct entities bumping into each other, and um, that's what creates action. Uh, transaction is more this view of there's a whole with different phases to it, so you don't have these stable entities that are apart from each other, but parts of a whole that are constantly adjusting to each other, right? So it's a different kind of, a different kind of view. And uh, the, the stimulus response psychology, SR psychology, in Dewey's time, um, and I think even today really, often combined the self-actional and interactional approaches. So you had these, um, um, these separate parts kind of bumping into each other, separate entities bumping into each other to create motion, to create movement, to create action, these jerks that um, Dewey, Dewey was talking about. And, um, but sometimes these, the kind of the ultimate origin of these jerks, these motions were thought to be um, changes in the soul or in the or something called an organism as distinct from the environment um, as a kind of soul or a mind that is separate ultimately from the environment. And so you get this self-actional thing, but it's, um, yeah, so that you got, kind of get these mix, mix of approaches of this interactionism, this mechanis mechanistic, physicalistic interactionism with elements of, um, of self-action. And you get that especially with genetic views, certain kinds of genetic views, like I think Dawkins' views at some points are have this idea of genes as these self-actors, right? So the genes are doing everything, controlling everything. And um, of course, a more maybe nuanced, more recent view is where you get the epigenetics, where you have the environment influencing the genes. So the genes are not just controlling the organism and helping the organism build its environment, but they're also uh, your the way your genes express are determined in part by the environment in, dif uh, in different part, uh, aspects of the environment. Uh, okay, I'll uh, go on. So Dewey, um, so Dewey's going to argue that sensation and movement are not separate things; that they're always occurring together. So they're necessarily coordinated with each other. So a movement always involves sensation. Sensation always involves movement. So the proper way to think about behavior is one sensory motor coordination uh, stimulating another, leading into another sensory motor coordination. So he talks about um, things leading into each other. Uh, stimulus and response then are not two things, but they're one thing that we, uh, that we can analyze from two different perspectives, because we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at um, a sensory motor coordination. So something that's both sensory and motor, that has both sensation and movement, but you're looking at it from two different perspectives in terms of its stimulus function or in terms of its response function. So we can still talk about stimulus and response as long as we understand that um, both stimulus and response have the same you would say ontological status. They're the same kind of thing, stimulus and response. Um, he also calls these divisions of labor. So I would maybe call them bodily divisions of labor. They're things the body does, um, and we look at it in two different ways, as a stimulus for something or as a response to something. So uh, Dewey says that only acts can be stimuli or responses. Um, the distinction, so the distinction between stimuli, stimulus and response as a kind of act is a, dis, a distinction in function. Um, but whatever the, whatever actions the body does is going to have both of these functions. So acts stimulate further acts, acts are respond, responding to previous acts, right? So movements responding to something and at the same time a stimulus for something. 
Uh, so a stimulus is just whatever the conditions for action are. So that involves, for example, perceiving the environment, but that's an act, right? Seeing, hearing, smelling, these are actions that are setting conditions for uh, further action. So those are the stimuli, the st right? Those acts are stimuli um, for further actions. And uh, stimulus, yeah, stimulus sets the conditions for further action. So it's not just something that's given, it's something that we have to discover through our actions, through movement, through muscles, using our muscles, right? Response is just, and then a response is just whatever follows from those conditions, right? So the, act, uh, the actions that we call the stimulus um, or stimuli set the conditions and the responsive actions, then, you know, the further, the future actions, fulfill or meet those conditions right but so it's the same kind of thing but it's just looking at um looking at a different phase of it or looking at a different function of it so an example one of the main examples he gives uh comes out of james in i think the uh, it's probably in the principles of psychology um uh, james talks of uh, william james should be clear uh, william james is talking about a child and a candle and the child is attracted to the the bright light of the candle so one way of looking at this so the uh the child sees a candle reaches for the candle this is the basic setup here the basic thing uh, of the exam the basic example and so a child one way of looking at this is a child has a sensation of light i see my light over here it responds by grabbing the light, by grabbing for the light. So that's the stimulus, that's the response. Then you have another stimulus. The child has a sensation of pain because it's touched a flame. And then it responds by withdrawing its hand. So you've got stimulus, response, stimulus, response. Light, grab, pain, withdraw. So you can have this idea, get this idea maybe of why. Um, Dewey thinks the reflex art concepts make concept makes life into a series of jerks. Um, but rather than seeing these things as separate moments in, um, you know, in a, a kind of behavior and in the environment, whether uh, instead of seeing these as just separate things happening, we should see these as larger phases, or sorry, as phases of a larger um, event of a larger coordination, bodily coordination uh, to the environment. So the sensation is not just a stimulus. It's not just sensation. It's seeing, right? You have to see something to have a sensation. You have to be seeing, involved in seeing to have sensations, visual sensations, of course. So it's an act. We're discovering something. We discover the stimulus that we respond to. Um, and the reaching, likewise, is not just a motor movement, but it's something that itself involves muscular sensation. Uh, hand and eye are often coordinated with each other in experience. We learn to see and uh, grab at the same time. George Herbert Mead talks about this a lot. Um, that our visual sense and our muscular kind of grabbing um, tactile senses are very uh, closely connected to each other. Our sense of how things feel is very closely connected to how we see things. So these are things are working together. Um, so in order for the, the child to reach for the candle, uh, to reach for the candle, to reach for the flame, he has to be looking at it. He has to be continually seeing it. If the child gets distracted by something, by some other bright object or by a sound or something like that, and you know, turns in that way, he's going to stop reaching probably. You know, generally you stop, you um, reach for what you're looking at. And if you uh, suddenly look at something else, you're going to stop reaching to prepare for whatever that new thing is. Uh, so the sensation, in other words, has to continue throughout the response. So these things are kind of uh, overlaying each other. They're going together with each other. They're going into each other, right? Sensation has to continue through response, along with, of course, other sensations that you're starting to get from the act of reaching and knowing where your hand is and all of that. Uh, and then when the child touches the candle, the heat 
pain sensation becomes part of that same circuit of experience that we're already involved in, or that the child is already involved in. So the sensation of light. So the child has had this sensation of light, of seeing and experiencing light. It takes on a bigger meaning after the child has touched the light with his hand. So it's not just a mere sensation now or a mere seeing, right? It's not just a sen uh, an interesting, intriguing, beautiful sensation of light. It's a, what he says, seeing of a light that means pain when contact occurs. So the meaning of that light, of that sensation has become transformed. It's become changed or broader in a way or different. So the original sensation, the act of just, um, of getting the light, of sensation, of sensing the light has become transformed. So it's, no longer just a pretty object to grab but it's a pretty yet scary maybe object to avoid contacting so maybe now it's something we don't want when we see we don't want to grab it we just want to look at it so rather than right so the traditional uh, ref, uh reflex arc theory sees uh, an arc going from stimulus to response, right? There's a stimulus, there is a response, and they're connected in some way. Uh, it's difficult in the um, earlier theory to say how they're connected, but there's stimulus and then there's response. Um, connected through some central process in the nervous system. Um, but Dewey prefers, rather than speaking of a arc, he prefers to speak of a circuit. And this is really interesting because um, people like Edmund Jacobson would also speak of circuits later on and people involved in, um, uh, well, I can't think of what, uh, cybernetics, that's the word I was thinking of. People kind of coming uh, a little bit connected with the world of cybernetics would talk more in terms of circuits. And I don't think they always um, knew Dewey's work but they came to a similar kind of conclusion from in a different path. Uh, so anyways, Dewey prefers to speak of a circuit in which coordinated acts constantly transform, are constantly transforming the meaning of the world. So we're not just stimulus response machines acting in a series of jerks. We're just, we're constantly acting to discover our world, to adapt to our world. So it's an active process. We're constantly, um, you know, sensing and adapting ourselves. And uh, stimulation is just the phase of the, the process which sets, sets conditions for further action. And the further action is what we call the response. It's the phase of that whole process which we call the response. So whatever the stimulus is, whether it's a, you know, a scene, a something that we see or something we smell, something we hear, it's gonna come to us in the midst of already ongoing behavior because we don't stop acting even when we're just sitting still. That involves um, various kinds of muscle control and so on. So we're continually acting. So whatever we perceive is whatever the stimulus is, it's coming to us in the middle of behavior. And it's interp interpreted in light of that behavior and it transforms that behavior. So the way res we respond to a stimulus, um, what the stimulus is for us, is determined by what we were doing when the stimulus occurred. Another example Dewey gives is about a sudden loud noise and this is in effect different stimuli depending on what you're doing so if you're uh, reading a book a loud noise is one thing is gonna um, be a lead to one kind of response right hearing hearing the act of hearing a loud noise is gonna create one kind of response if you're hunting hearing a loud noise is another um, kind of thing. It's going to lead to another kind of response. If you're a soldier on like a midnight lookout, right? Um, hearing a loud noise is another, a uh, totally other kind of thing. Um, if you're doing, Dewey mentions, if you're doing a chemical experiment, right? A loud noise, hearing a sudden loud noise is going to cause another totally different kind of response. So the conditions for the loud noise being a certain kind of stimulus are um, for, for being even a loud noise, right? Are set by what we're doing at the time. Um, so the key points here, just to conclude, um, 
stimulus and response, sensation and action are not two different things, but the same thing that we're looking at from two different perspectives. So it's either setting conditions for action or for fulfilling the conditions for action. And pretty much any act that you can think of is uh, going to be fulfilling either prior conditions or it's going to be setting new conditions for action, right? So it's got these two aspects to it. All right, so that is a bit about Dewey's critique of reflex arcs theory of stimulus response theory. And that's all for today. So thanks for listening and see you again sometime.